one of the things I really liked about this book is the way you make sense of the Trump-Russia connection by going back, right. way back, 30 years. And in a way, the continuous thread is that Donald Trump always wanted a building in Moscow with his damn name on it. Right. And if you want to just reduce it to like one thing that Trump wanted from Russia, that's the thing he's wanted for 30 years. Well, well he, he had, you're absolutely right. And as we point out in the book, he had these made these multiple attempts to do it. But the story in terms of the Trump presidency and you know, really begins with that Miss Universe pageant in Moscow in 2013, uh, when he flies to Moscow to preside over, you know, his his signature property, Miss Universe. But he's really interested is he sees this as the chance to finally do the deal in Moscow. For one thing, he's got a partner, Aris Agalarov billionaire oligarch who is close to Putin. And Aguilarov had agreed to sponsor the Miss Universe pageant. So he's got the beginnings of this relationship, but he sees this as an opportunity to get that Trump Tower in Moscow deal finally done with Aguilarov. And the one missing piece is what, what the, the reason he's so uh, excited about working with Aguilarov is Aguilarov had just not long before been awarded a medal by Putin. He was known as Putin's builder. He had done all these big construction projects for the for the Kremlin, including some big uh, uh, summit in Vladivostok that uh, Putin had. World, um, he, he was building World Cups. He was Cups building the World Cup. He was building the World Cup. Okay. So for Trump, the most important missing piece was getting Putin's blessing. And so this this is when you can really start to see it actually goes back five months earlier in Las Vegas when they first uh, when Aguilarov's first go to Moscow to Las Vegas and they agree to sponsor the Miss Universe pageant. And that's when you start to see all these fawning comments about Putin. What a great guy Putin is. I know Putin. He really, uh, you know, he's doing a terrific job. There. And he repeatedly <laughs> lied and said he'd met him and yeah. already knew him and yeah. they had a relationship, none of which was true at the time. Trump right. was desperately trying to get him to show up at his right. beauty right. pageant. The, the, the point, the, uh, what really shows this and what shows it in the book, and it starts off in the first chapter is when he is in Moscow, you know, he's there with Miss Universe. And he's also thinking about a, a, this big tower deal that he wants to pull off with the Aguilarovs. But what he keeps asking everybody around him is, where's Putin? Is Putin coming to the pageant? Am I going to hear from Putin? Can I have a meeting with Putin? You know, he's there for 36 hours and this is what consumes him. And he, he's told, well, you're going to hear from Putin. Putin's going to call. And he keeps waiting. Where's the call? Where's the call? Where's the call? Finally, he gets the call and it's not from Putin. It's from Dmitry Peskov, Putin's chief spokesperson, who explains that Putin's busy. The king of Holland is meeting with him and he's stuck in a traffic jam. Can't get, get to see you. That you Courtesy know, call. Sorry, you know, can't courtesy, make it. You know, courtesy call. Um, and, he's, and, and, and Trump is really, really disappointed. I think he thought that if he could sit down with Putin, that would be it. This would be the best relationship ever. He'd get whatever he wanted. The two of them would rule the world. Whether or not <laughs> they make a nuclear you know, treaty you know, while they were at it, within, yeah. within an hour. And so he's very disappointed. And Trump being in fashion, I know you're going to find this really hard to believe, Jake. You know, he's talking about this with a with a staffer from Miss Universe, the organization, and he hears that you know Putin's not coming. He says, "Well, you know, we can tell people he came. Who's going to know?" <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, they, the staff says, no, we shouldn't do that. The rule we apply on this show. <laughs> there call, are rules? The, no, not, not that kind of rule. <laughs> but we apply a rule called Trump's razor, which is when you're trying to explain something, go with the stupidest possible explanation <laughs> because it's the most likely to be right. This is Josh Marshall's rule. And it's very good. And you guys actually come up with it, right? If we're trying to explain Trump's affection for Vladimir Putin and his weird alliance with him. He wants to build a ba damn right. building with his name on it. Well, Why isn't that enough? Well, Why do we need let, a let, let, let me take it a little step further, though, it, it, actually. from And this is, again, from the book. So they go to Moscow. He They do reach an agreement, Trump does, with the Aguilarovs. There's a letter of intent signed to build that Trump Tower. Donald Trump Jr. is put in charge of the project. February 2014, a few months later, Ivanka flies to Moscow to scout potential sites for Trump Tower with Emin Agalarov. What happens? That's the same month 
the Ukraine crisis blows up. Putin annexes Crimea, intervenes in Ukraine. The U.S. and EU impose sanctions on uh, Russia. One of those sanctioned is Spurbank, which was the majority Sperm, owned. Sperm Bank, as we call it okay, here on the show. Right. Yeah, so. We have Russian government owned, majority owned bank that was going to finance the Trump Tower deal. And it is the, at, at this time that the Trump Tower deal collapses. It was now, killed by sanctions. I, I mean, well, that was Rob Goldstone's probably. theory. He I mean, believes the sanctions... that that was what killed it. So if that's the case, it explains a lot, including Trump's hostility to sanctions. It killed his dream yeah. of Trump Tower well, and, in and, Moscow. And, and yeah. you, you know, you raised the point of, you know, again, a, sort of a clue hiding in plain sight. Why is he engaged in this bromance or something darker with, with Vladimir Putin? It doesn't end there. To me, what is stunning, and it was reported, but I don't think it's been fully absorbed, is that for the first few months of his campaign as president, when he's leading the pack, he has another deal. He's negotiating another deal to build a tower in Moscow. And he's doing this with a fellow I'm sure you've discussed a lot of times on the show named Felix Sater, a former felon. And while he's doing this, he's not telling the voters to whom he says, I will put America's interest. First, he's, you know, he's trying to build this deal, and it can only happen with Putin's approval. And so when he's asked about Putin as a presidential candidate, he is saying again what he's continued to say all along, positive things. Joe Scarborough says, well, he's a killer. He murders journalists. And Trump says, how do you know that? It's not proven. Well, what else could he say? If his chief concern was negotiating this deal, can you go out there and say, you're right, he's a thug, he's a murderer, he's a killer, we should have nothing to do with him, while you're trying to negotiate a deal with him? So that was one of, I think, the biggest secrets that he kept. And then later on, he said, I had nothing to do with Russia, of course, as you know, is a lie. But that, I think, represents some of the profound strangeness of the uh, of the Putin Trump relationship and the fact that he really kept a lot of this a secret. Well, there's a huge uh, change in context, David. Right in in 2016, when it suddenly appears possible that Donald Trump could win the nomination and potentially get elected president. So you know, people say, well, the, you know, the the Internet Research Agency wasn't trying to elect Donald Trump. At the beginning, they weren't. That wasn't on the horizon. At some point in 2016, it became a possibility, a target of opportunity. And likewise, Donald Trump may well have started running for president thinking, hey, this is an opportunity to increase my chances of building Trump Tower in Moscow. Yeah. And, but at some point, he accidentally became a real candidate, well, a viable to, candidate. But I hate to correct you. There's one thing that we have in the book is that in 2015, this great reporter named Adrian Chen, who had basically written the first English about the, uh, story Internet, about Research about the Internet Research yeah. Agency in June or July of 2015 and exposing what was doing, something that the U.S. intelligence community continued to miss. In December of 2015, he goes on a podcast and he goes, you know, I've been keeping track of these. IRA, Internet Research Agency bots that I've been, you know, that have been doing all sorts of weird things in the last year or two. And I've noticed December 2015, a lot of them now have become conservative trolls for Trump. So from an early period. Well, that's about when it would have happened, yeah, though, yeah, right? So, I mean, yeah, those yeah. were after the initial debates and he was getting all this attention yeah, but, and yeah, all this traction. Yeah, and that right, was, right yeah. there, right? When yeah. he's taking off, it seems like a switch is thrown. That's when a smart bot would start trolling for Trump <laughs> yeah. instead of just against Hillary. Nate Silver says he has a better chance. That's what we're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it's also clear that that's about the time that you can see the Kremlin really making a concerted effort to penetrate the Trump campaign, to cultivate people in the Trump campaign. You know, uh, George Papadopoulos gets named to the Foreign Policy Advisory Board, and suddenly this professor he'd met in Italy who had paid him no attention uh, but had all these connections to the uh, Kremlin uh, start follows up with him, starts to cultivate him in London, uh, uh, takes him to lunch with a woman he introduces as Putin's niece. That's when Carter Page, who got named to the Foreign Policy Advisory Board, gets invited to speak at the new economic school in Moscow and give this prestigious address that's covered by the pro-Putin media in, in Russia. Um, so 
you really see um, uh, a, a concerted effort, a campaign to, you know, they see this guy and the people around him as people they can exploit. You know, it's like, f- it's full service. It's like, uh, a zo- you know, complete zone coverage. They're trying to penetrate the campaign, obviously, to get their hooks into it, to find out what's happening, maybe to even to influence it. And at the same time, they start moving. They've started penetrating the Democratic Party. They've, they've gotten into John Podesta's email um, in the spring of 2016. Right. And so they start a campaign also to tilt the field in Trump's favor, certainly against Hillary at the start, and then probably more with the aim to help Trump. So the Russians really are are covering it both ways. What can we do to figure out how to help or how to understand the Trump campaign, get people in there? We still don't have the full story on what Manafort was telling Deripaska, the Russian oligarch who he owed millions of dollars to while he was running the campaign. But we do know they were reaching out to and trying to cultivate Carter Page and, and Papadopoulos. At the same time, they were trying to influence things. And at the same time, you know, later on when this becomes public, the Trump campaign, this is what I call collusion. We don't necessarily say it explicitly in the book, but they engage in the cover-up. They keep denying when they have reason to believe, when they have reason to know, when they've been informed that the Kremlin wants to help them, they keep going out there publicly and saying, there's no Russian meddling here. Imagine if you were standing in front of a bank and you knew the bank was being robbed and you said to people passing by, there's no bank robbery going on. Now, whether that's illegal or not depends on how much you knew beforehand, but that's collusion in a cover-up. That's providing an alibi in the book. We call it aiding and abetting. So there's like a lot of different Russian angles all being played simultaneously. So let me ask you to to rate those angles a little bit. There are lots of different collusion ser- scenarios, uh, many if not all of these being investigated by Robert Mueller. But there is the Papadopoulos scenario. There is the Carter Page scenario. There is the Paul Manafort scenario. There is the Roger Stone scenario. Uh, there is the Trump the, Tower, the Trump Tower meeting, yeah. uh, the, the, which I guess would be the Aguilera of the continuation right. of that. That's at least five or six. Now, it's possible they're all true. It's possible they're all coordinated. It's possible none of them meant and it will turn out to be anything, but that there was a cover up without a crime. Or maybe there's something more like what you were talking about, David, where there wasn't very active collusion, but there was some recognition of what was probably happening and an effort to downplay it. What if, Having steeped yourselves in all of this culture around Trump and Trump's campaign, what do you think are the most I, likely scenarios? I, I think it's very hard to imagine this was a grand conspiracy that was well thought out and plotted in which there were regular meetings and contacts and you do that, I do that, you know, if for no other reason that the Trump campaign like the Trump White House, like everything about Trump is engulfed in chaos. <laughs> it would be incompatible with the level of chaos yeah, that we're familiar yeah, with. Yeah. You know, they, they wouldn't be, have been capable of pulling off a grand conspiracy like that. But that is also what made them so vulnerable mm. to these various Russian approaches and manipulations. 